family and it's a horrible day for the nation. The ark comes back only because the Philistines can't handle it. They can't handle the ark. And why can't they handle the ark? Because everywhere the ark goes, it causes mayhem for the Philistines. Hemorrhoids, mice, hemorrhoids and mice. Mice with hemorrhoids? No, I don't know about that. But there's definitely mice and hemorrhoids involved in the, in the, uh, in the punishment that they have. They send it back, and that's where we pick up the story. The Ark comes back into Israel, and even with amongst the Israelites, the Ark has tremendous power. Uh, the people at Beit Shemesh, where the Ark uh, first rests, they end up getting killed. Um, 50, over 50,000 people get killed uh, in the Israelites, uh, of, of the Israelites, because they can't uh, handle the Ark either. And um, let me pop this up here. And uh, that's kind of where we're, where, where, um, where uh, the Ark is taken to uh, Kiryat Yarim, another place on the way to back to Shiloh, back to Jerusalem, back to the center of Israel. It's still kind of like central Israel, not, you know, somewhere today between Tel Aviv and, and, uh, and Jerusalem. By the way, we were, I was working yesterday on our, our next trip to Israel, which we're, we're, planning on going in june um and also uh, november and then the following february we're going to actually release three dates so, so people can start uh getting ready for that uh june 6th would be the first departure and then and then the next one would be in uh november i can't remember the date in november but um yeah we're working on it now and i'm getting excited thinking about going to some back to some of these places it's been four years It'll be five years by the time we actually go there since I've, I've been to Israel, which is, I think, the longest time in my life that, I've, um, that I haven't been in Israel. So it's, I mean, obviously COVID related, but we're working on that, trying to get insurance so that people don't have to worry about um, their own health. And you have to actually have proof of insurance when you get to Israel so that, you know, that if you got sick there, that you could be, you know, you could be taken care of. Yeah, we're looking at November 15th to the 25th is the dates for November and then February 7th through the 17th in 2023. So anyways, um, let's read about Israel though. And what happens, um, uh, the ark where we left off right here in verse two, the ark was housed at Kiryat Yarim 20 years. And it says that Israel yearned after the Lord, which again, if you look at the note, seems again another one of those phrases that in samuel seems to maybe either be a scribal error or corrupted or we don't exactly know what the hebrew well we think we know what it means which essentially is it's a positive thing that israel is 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 doing the right thing um but uh here we pick it up with samuel so rosemary if you'd like to uh if you'd like to read this and Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if you mean to return to the Lord with all your heart, you must remove the alien gods and the Ashtarod from your midst and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him alone. Then he will deliver you from the hands of the Philistines. And the Israelites removed the Baalim and the Ashtarod and they served the Lord alone. Yeah. So I think it kind of makes sense what we just read i don't know if it needs a lot of explanation in the sense that um they seem to want to do the right thing uh which means in this case that they have not been worshiping god alone um and it's interesting because it may mean that they're praying to god but it may mean also if you read it carefully that they're also worshiping these Baal gods and these Ashtarot goddesses, and that they're using these in addition to the way that they're worshiping God. Um, it seems as though, again, we know the Bible says frequently not to worship these other gods. It's, it's in the Ten Commandments. But it, it's a problem, and it's a problem for the Israelites throughout their history. So before they have a king, after they have a king, while they have a king, it's always a problem. Um, guess what? 
the archaeology bears this out, which is that there were Ashtarot, especially goddesses. Um, we haven't find, found too many Baals, but we found a whole lot of uh, feminine goddesses uh, all over the land of Israel that date from this period. So it does seem accurate when Samuel is telling them to get rid of these things, that they had them. The archaeology bears it out. Um, and we know it's from the Israelite period based on carbon dating and where we found them and the places we found them, which were clearly just Israelite cities. So, you know, it, it's backed up by archaeology. So here's what Samuel does. Samuel said, assemble all Israel at Mitzpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. They assembled at Mitzpah and they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. They fasted that day, and there they confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. And Samuel acted as chieftain of the Israelites at Mitzpah. Yeah, so he's um, he's definitely exerting leadership, judge-type leadership. We've seen this in the book of Judges, right? We saw, you know, well, actually, we've seen a few judges act this way, but most probably prominently was actually the prophet and judge Deborah. She actually did similar things um, for the Israelites at at uh, during the time of Judges on Mount Tabor, so in the north. So this is there's a historical basis for judges to do these things. So here's what happens. When the Philistines heard that the Israelites had assembled at Mitzpah, the lords of the Philistines marched out against Israel. Hearing of this, the Israelites were terrified of the Philistines, and they implored Samuel, do not neglect us and do not refrain from crying out to the Lord our God to save us from the hands of the Philistines. Thereupon, Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord in behalf of Israel, and the Lord responded to him. For as Samuel was presenting the burnt offering, and as the Philistines advanced to attack Israel, the Lord thundered mightily against the Philistines that day. He threw them into confusion, and they were routed by Israel. Wow. So um, Mitzpah was a great day for Israel, great day for the leadership of Samuel. The men of Israel sallied out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, striking them down to a point below beth -car. Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and named it Ebenezer. For up to now, he said, the Lord has helped us. Yeah, and here again, we have the name Ebenezer. And we talked about the, the name Ebenezer. It's not a common name but it literally means the stone of my help, the rock of my help. So, um, you know, Mitzpah is, um, there are different places called Mitzpah, but we know where this Mitzpah is. Um, and let me see what the note here, you know, it just says the translation of, of it. Um, you notice here that when we look at where this happens, um, there is this note here, which is uh, when we look at the Septuagint and we look at, at Chronicles, there's actually a different word used, which is not just the, the word Shen. We actually think that it's, it's a, either a nickname for or um, uh, a spelling that kind of fell out for this place called Yeshena, which again is, is in the center of Israel, not far from uh, Jerusalem uh, in the, you know, in the territory of Benjamin. And um, um, the Philistines meet a great defeat there with the help, obviously, as we heard from God. The Philistines were humbled and did not invade the territory of Israel again. And the hand of the Lord was set against the Philistines as long as Samuel lived. 
The towns which the Philistines had taken from Israel, from Ekron to Gath, were restored to Israel. Israel recovered all her territory from the Philistines. There was also peace between Israel and the Amorites. Right. So what do we know from this? We know that Israel recovered territory from the Philistines. Did they get rid of the Philistines? No. The Philistines are still very much inhabiting the coastal territories, especially the cities of Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gaza. Those cities on the Mediterranean, they're still very well entrenched there. Bible doesn't say that we took those territories. It doesn't say that we drove them out. It does say that we took their their their, their internal inland cities, the cities that were um, maybe if you call it the the Israelite, you know, areas um, that were inland, those they took back. And so that was a major victory for the Philistines. The Philistines had to back off during the time of Samuel. That's what it says. It says as long as Samuel lived, the Philistines were not a problem, or at least didn't encroach on their territory. Um, <clears throat> we were okay. Not only that, it says that we were okay with the Canaanites, the Amorites who already still were living in the area, that we had peace with them. They didn't get out of line with us either. Now, <clears throat> it's important because both of these people are not Israelites. They sometimes fight with us. And essentially, the Canaanites are living inside Israel in, in the internal kind of like in, in the center and the heartland in the inland area. And the Philistines are living on the coast. So the Israelites at this point have to contend with the Israelites are contending with two groups of people. They're contending with the Philistines on the coast and they're con contending with the Canaanites inside their territory. So understand that as Samuel is judge and he's bringing peace to the people they still have these potential threats. And, um, you know, there's definitely some analogies today to, to, you know, what Israel deals with in the sense that, you know, in the area of Gaza, that's under uh, Palestinian Hamas control. <clears throat> and then inside Israel, <clears throat> in the area that's called the West Bank or Judea and Samaria or Occupied territory, whatever you want to call it, those areas that are Palestinian cities, those are inside Israel. And so there's both, you know, Israel is kind of it has it has territories or 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 again political a political reality of having um, a potential threat on both on both sides, and uh, and very much so here uh, during the time of Samuel, Israel is also kind of dealing with these two threats did the philistines and the canaanites get along with each other we don't know we don't really know because we don't have we don't have those records uh the the literature on them and the archaeology is not a hundred percent certain on whether philistines and and canaanites went to war against each other it probably did at some point were they sometimes allied against israel yeah it's possible um, did they sometimes, did the Israelites sometimes ally with the Canaanites against the Philistines? Yeah, that's possible too. So the reality is, is that these organizations and groups, these entities, they're a part of the reality of the landscape of what Israel was dealing with during this period. From the time of Moses through the time of, of uh, King Saul and King David. So keep that in mind because we're going to see it in Saul and we're going to see it in, in, in King David, both parts of, of the book of Samuel that are coming up. The Canaanite peoples and also the Philistines, the way they're playing this out. They're different. Again, the Canaanites are, if you will, native, live on the land for a long time. We might be a lot closer to the Canaanites than we'd like to admit from, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the genetics and from the, you know, the archaeology. We might be closer to the Canaanites. Um, but the Philistines were definitely an, an Aegean people. They had different background. They had different for a time. We don't know um, how long the Philistines continued to speak 
you know, kind of Greek dialect or how, how quickly they absorbed the local Canaanite and Hebrew languages, the Hebrew, you know, those languages, Semitic languages. But this is Israel's reality, right? And uh, it was Israel's reality then. And as I said, it's not that much different geographically from what Israel deals with today. So here's what it says about Samuel. And this now is focusing back on the internal politics. Samuel judged Israel as long as he lived. Each year, he made the rounds of Bethel, Gilgal, and Mitzpah, and acted as judge over Israel at all those places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there too he would judge Israel. He built an altar there to the Lord. Yeah, and here we see that, that Samuel had a circuit. He wrote a circuit, and that's exactly what, you know, is the definition of you know, writing a circuit. And Ramah is, you know, this special Ramah in, in, um, in, uh, you know, which was actually the place where his father came from, was from, was uh, Ramah. Um, it's not far from Jerusalem. None of these places are that far from Jerusalem today. They're all kind of in central Israel, but, you know, it's kind of north central, south central, but they're also all central they're not that far from each other but it tells us that he did make the rounds he didn't just make everybody come to see him but he would go to see them and you know it's interesting because i like to tell you know like my you know we've talked about this before i like to remind people that that israel around this time was very much uh i like to compare it to the old west and when you when you read about this uh judge and prophet Samuel that's writing a circuit around uh, around ancient Israel, it really reminds you of that, you know, that sheriff or uh, judge that comes to town and is there, you know, for a few weeks and hears the cases and then goes on to the next cases. And I mean, that's why we, that's, those were circuit, those were circuit judges. I mean, that's what they, they actually did at, at a, a point in time in our country, in our nation's history, these were circuit jobs. These were jobs where you didn't stay in one place for, you know, for a very long, uh, you know, a month or two or a couple of weeks, and then you moved on. So um, that's what you do when your country is, uh, doesn't have the central authority and doesn't then able to, you know, kind of establish their own, their own uh, centers, you kind of make something that can be fluid, right? And, and be adaptable. So that's what Samuel does. Um, but he does have this special home in Ramah, which was kind of his, his base there. And he also judges there too. So he also judges and he builds an altar there. Now, is this significant? Yes, it's very significant. It's not a throwaway line and it's not one to just go, well, so what? He built an altar. He had a um, he had a religious center there too. Samuel had no authority to build an altar anywhere based on the Torah. So either this was written before the Torah or he completely went against the Torah. Samuel is a Levite. His father was from Ephraim, but he's a Levite. So he's a Levite. He's, you know, connected to Moses. He's from the tribe that the Kohanim are a part of, but he's not a Kohen. He's not a priest. Eli, his boss, his mentor was a priest. Eli can make an altar. He has no authority to make an altar based on being a Levite. So this little line here tells us that at least during Samuel's time, the Levites, or maybe this Levite, had the power to do that. So it's significant. The fact that he made an altar there is not something that we can just say, well, so what? He made an altar. I mean, he didn't. The Bible says you can't, or at least the Torah says you can't do that. So he does. Um, and now we read what happens during his authority. Um Again, if you were here the last couple of weeks, this next chapter is highly um, ironic 
it's uh it's disturbing it's tragic it's all those things but it also is uh quite powerfully uh, real and we've seen it happen way too many times in history so let's take a look at chapter eight when samuel grew old he appointed his sons judges over israel the name of his firstborn son was Yoel, and his second son's name was Abiyah. They sat as judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not follow in his ways. They were bent on gain. They accepted bribes, and they subverted justice. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, again, ironic. It's not just coincidental. It's tragic because again, Samuel had seen his boss, Ailey's own sons, Hophni and Pinchas, go off the rails. He had seen it, he knew what the potential was for your children to take advantage of your job and to, uh, you know, not, not uh, you know, not merit the family legacy to, so to you know, so to speak. Um, and it happens in his own family. So this is, this is really upsetting and must, uh, must, there must be some kernel of, of, you know, I mean, I, I believe it happened. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what else to say in this book. That's a tribute to Samuel. It must've happened. I mean, it must, there must be, they would have swept us under the rug if they could have, and, and it wasn't. They, they tell us it happened. Look, we, as I shared with you in Judges, we know that, or we believe that this happened in Moses' own family, right? That his own grandson became a renegade Levite priest, so it doesn't surprise us. It's not shocking. We know enough of these stories in our own day where, where you know, somebody's, um, somebody's child, uh, you know, there's expectations that they'll be a great leader and they turn out not to be such a great leader. Um, so that's, um, that's compounded by the fact that they're supposed to, be doing God's work and instead they take advantage of it and they accept bribes and they subvert justice and so this is this is terrible this is a terrible thing terrible thing that happens in Samuel's own family after watching it happen previously all the elders of Israel assembled and came to Samuel at Ramah and they said to him you have grown old and your sons have not followed your ways. Therefore, appoint a king for us to govern us like all other nations. Samuel was displeased that they said, give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord replied to Samuel, heed the demand of the people and everything they say to you, for it is not you that they have rejected. It is me they have rejected as their king. Okay, so the people come to Samuel and say, you've grown old and your sons have not followed your ways. Appoint a king for us. That's what they say. So there's, there's two grievances and there's one solution. And to some extent, there's a justification for their solution. So it's a very short sentence, um, but everything's there. Everything is contained in that statement, which to some extent, right, is one of the most powerful and course direction changing statements in Jewish history. There's very few moments in Jewish history that change more than the people coming to Samuel and say, give us a king. You wonder why they would have thought the sons of a king would be any more likely to follow in their father's ways than the sons of a prophet. Correct, right? 
so we're going to get to what Samuel tells them. What's interesting about this again is the two is the two problems, right? You've grown old and your sons can't continue. So there's two issues there. And they say, therefore, give us a king. Now, it says in the text that Samuel was displeased by not the fact that they came and challenged him about this, but what they offer up as a solution. It doesn't say that Samuel was displeased that they said, you're too old and your sons are bad. He said he's upset that they said this is what the solution is. So he's not happy with what they've come to them and uh come to him with and you know what's interesting is that their justification for it isn't you know we need to have somebody different but that we want to be like other nations so their 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 solution to it or their justification for their solution is based on they want to be like everybody else so it, to some extent, they have a they have a legitimate grievance, right? They have a legitimate grievance that need, and they have a, they have a problem that needs to be solved. There's the solution that they propose is in itself a problem, and another problem is their justification for their solution, their 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 motivation for that solution is so they can be like everybody else. Now. Maybe under that is a you know that that maybe is code for a lot of other things, which is so that we can have a centralized government, so that we can have a powerful leader that can lead us into battle, that we can have some consistency, all, all the things that you might be thinking about. But there's a problem here, which is that Israel is not supposed to be like every other nation. Because if you're like every other nation, then just worship any God. And what difference does it make? You have no special role in this world. You have no special, you're, you have not, the, there is no revolution here. There's no idea here that's going to change the world. Because you're literally now relegating yourself to saying, I just want to be like everybody else. And it's, you know, it's frustrating for, for Samuel, and now you can see what God's response is. God's also frustrated. God's frustrated. God doesn't like, we know right away, God says, listen to them and don't take it personally. That's, that's God's response. God's response is, Samuel, it's not you that they rejected, it's me, which is a really compassionate way of dealing with somebody who feels you know bad that's been offended you know it feels offended that feels that feels uh, you know that they've had a vote of no confidence they haven't rejected you they reject me they reject my principles they reject this isn't about you not a hundred percent about him really not a hundred percent but samuel doesn't have there is no samuel can provide no answer he, he he's can't lead anymore and his kids can't lead so he doesn't he's not the answer but because their answer is so against what god wants god is able then to step up and say samuel don't take a person and so god does something really compassionate here which is not to not to say yeah samuel we got a problem your son your sons are a mess he doesn't say that god doesn't say that god doesn't reinforce it and nowhere here, by the way, is there any indication that Samuel disagrees with their assessment of his sons. Nowhere here is there, yeah, they don't get my sons, right? They don't understand my sons. My sons are trying to do their best they can. None of that. He, he doesn't argue on behalf of his sons, Samuel. He doesn't defend them. So keep this in mind, because again, this point right here, is where Jewish history goes off in a whole nother direction. What would have been the answer? That's a, that's a question that's legitimately, we have to ask ourselves every time we read this. What was the solution? What could have happened in this moment? What was, what was the solution other than God saying, listen to the people?
They've rejected me as king. It's actually, we're not done with, with God's answer here. Here's God's answer in its entirety, the rest of it. Like everything else they have done ever since I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and worshiping other gods, so they are doing to you. Heed their demand. But warn them solemnly and tell them about the practices of any king who will rule over them. Yep. So he says to them, you've got a situation that I've been dealing with ever since I took them out of Egypt. They've always, they've always rejected me. So it's now God's also saying, there's a history here and it's no different than what I've been dealing with for a long time. And so there is that sense of, you know, this is par for the course. Now, um, I guess you could say, keep in mind, well, well, for, first of all, we know every other nation in this period of time, there, there are no democracies. There's no Republican systems of government at this time. We're talking about 1100, 1100 BCE. It's difficult to, for us to project our ideas onto these people. But this is not what God had put into motion. He had put in a tribal situation where there are judges and prophets and priests but there is no room for a, a king. But, but by the time that this is actually written down, there's a real question of whether a king by that, by the time that was written is assumed, right? And so it's just, there's nothing you can really say about it because we already have, we have, the system's already in play, been put in place. Those are things I guess you can think about as we're reading this. You know, when it was written, when it was written, the fact that there already was a king, there's a king who maybe is approving this text. I mean, I guess you got to keep those things in mind. But this is not the way God envisions them to be uh, the, the Israelites to be living with a king in charge. And so he, he, he tells Samuel, tell them what comes with the king. So here's what, here's what happens. Here's what Samuel does. Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this will be the practice of the king who will rule over you. He will take your sons and appoint them as his charioteers and horsemen, and they will serve as outrunners for his chariots. He will appoint them as his chiefs of thousands and of fifties, or they will have to plow his fields, reap his harvest, and make his weapons and the equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters as perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will seize your choice fields, vineyards, and olive groves, and give them to his courtiers. He will take a tenth part of your grain and vintage, and give it to his eunuchs and courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves, your choice young men and your asses and put them to work for him. He will take a 10th part of your flocks and you shall become his slaves. The day will come when you cry out because of the king whom you yourselves have chosen and the Lord will not answer you on that day. Um, so that is uh, verse 11, 12, the people 13, don't choose 16, a king, 16, the, the people don't choose a king. Um, okay. So I yes, mean, they want a king. chosen to have a king. So, so yes. So, um, um, and God is basically telling them, He's not going to treat you any better than Pharaoh did. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, this, so this is 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's the, it's like nine verses. I mean, this is a huge text in the Torah. This this is a huge text, which is the text which establishes, and to some extent, one can make the argument was written after the fact. We know what the kings did. That this is, um, either you know he's completely prophetic and everything he says happens, or it's written after all these things had already happened. Regardless. This is a huge part of this, the this chapter. It's it's worth nine verses of Torah of the Tanakh. It establishes what happens when people submit themselves to a monarchy, and again, it is that they literally will become slaves. So you are willingly choosing to make yourself a slave to a human being. And understand that this will come back to bite you. I've told you everything and you're not going to like it. So if you think, oh, whatever, I'll take it. I'm going to tell you, you will come to regret this and you will actually say, why did we do this? We don't want to have the king. So, so it's not only, hey, this is all the stuff. And then you're, you're going you're gonna to say, hey, um, I can live with that. Samuel actually tells him, you will not want to live with that. You will come to regret this, not make your own decision and know that maybe you'll come to like this. You will not like this. And he tells them that he tells them this is what will happen and that you will not like it. So everything, everything that you can imagine that a again a king could do take your children take your product take your produce take your money everything that's going to happen with a king and they knew because other kings had been doing the same thing for generations ever since people organized themselves into city states this is what was happening um th th this is what the Bible tells us comes with a monarchy. So there is no question. There is, I mean, no question that the author of this text, however it comes down, whether Samuel said it or whether somebody wrote that Samuel said it, there is no question that the person who believes this and who says this does not want to have a king. It's because there's a judgment on this. It's not just this is what's there. And gosh, don't you think that that's bad? No, it's bad. And you're not going to like it. So in no uncertain terms, does it say you're not going to like it? So that's what they, it's what Samuel does, what God says. It's there for us to read. It's there for us to read every time we think about what people who lived under monarchies had to deal with. And to some extent, what governments do that you would say at some point is intolerable there is no question because we have the texts where they quoted this this was of fundamental importance to the original founders of this country and the people who came to this country from you know uh from primarily from england but from other places who wanted to escape monarchy there was no question that to the pilgrims this text from Samuel chapter eight was a fun fundamental text for them, for people like, and even before, you know, before Thomas Paine, that, you know, people who really quoted the Bible, because Paine was definitely along the lines of some of people like Thomas Jefferson, who didn't have a lot of um, time for, for religion, but for the people who did have, um, you know, who did have uh, a, a feeling for um, for religion, including some of the pastors in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and some of these other places where the, the text, the biblical text was very important. This chapter, chapter eight, was a foundational text for the arguments they made against the King of England. There was a biblical justification for it. And this is the biblical justification for it. It's not a throwaway line. It's not a line that you could pass over. It's a 
it's half a chapter. So um, what, what are they doing by throwing off a monarchy? They're literally saying, <laughs> we're getting back to God's way. So here's what happens when Samuel tells them that and gives them that warning. But the people would not listen to Samuel's warning. No, they said, we must have a king over us that we may be like all the other nations. Let our king rule over us and go out at our head and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he reported it to the Lord. Yep. And so they say no. They say no. And uh, their final kind of challenge is we need to have a king who can lead us in battle. And to some extent, that at that point, Samuel really doesn't have an argument. Doesn't have an argument. Because that is one of the things that they're missing. And Samuel doesn't argue at that point. He takes the information and he goes back to God. He doesn't argue that point. Maybe he can't. Maybe he knows it's futile anyways. All he had to do was tell the people, you know, tell God what, you know, the people are, are dead set. And that's what they're going to do. But again, they repeat the same line. We must be like other nations. And that probably, to some extent, is the critical part of that, of that, that you know, that clause there is the part that Samuel, even if he thinks that the people have a legitimate point about needing to have a ruler who can lead them into battle, that line probably sticks with him because he's he's essentially hearing from the people we just want to be like everybody else and that probably was the most disconcerting part of this is why you know again why are you stepping back and being like everybody else because it's hard to be an outlier yeah I you know it's well, even the ancient nations when they had more democratic forms of government, they would appoint a dictator when they had to go to war. Yeah. Yeah. But this idea of willingly wanting to be like other nations is interesting because it does, it does recognize. So, so here, here's what I wanted, I want you to just to, to consider, because this, this is the revolutionary idea of judaism this is where judaism says no because in the ancient world the normal the normal answer is if our god and our king as god's emissary in this world are the most powerful then our god is the most powerful we are right and we are god's chosen people so the idea of chosenness from the standpoint of a concept in the ancient world would essentially, would, would essentially be, look, the proof is in our power. There's something different here, which is, which is the approach of saying, no, we're not trying to be like everybody else. That there's literally this idea that, no, we don't need to do what everyone else is doing. We shouldn't be doing what everyone else is doing because God's actually giving us a different way to live. There's a different approach to, to, to this which isn't about well we're the most powerful so god must be on our side because essentially to some extent when you when we read exodus you know we can literally say well god delivers us from the egyptians god fights for us and so god is more powerful than the egyptians god's more powerful than the egyptian gods but there's also maybe still what needs to be developed and what we see developing and we see here is this idea that the replacement for, you know, the, the, the God isn't, that 
that God doesn't need a human being in this world to represent him. And they don't get it. They don't want to hear that. That's not, that, that's not important to the Israelites. They want to instead be like everybody else. And that's the part that's, that's so frustrating here. It kind of sticks out and maybe we pay more attention to it because we're Americans and because we know that there's an alternative to monarchy, that there's a, there's an alternative to having a dictatorship. There's an, there's an alternative to just saying, well, we're more powerful than everybody else because we have a bigger army and because we have more power, economic power, and because we're the ones in charge. Instead, we understand, and I do think we, we get this as Americans, to say it's not because our, our nation is more powerful. It's because there's an idea that's at the foundation of this country, which we believe everybody can have too, which is that there's an inherent dignity and freedom that every human being is entitled to. And, um, and that people, that part of justice is being able to have control over your own destiny and not assigning it to somebody else who can peculiarly, you know, decide, hey, today we're going to war. I don't like these people or they, they married the woman that I wanted to marry. There's, there's something that we feel as Americans, like a kinship with this idea that, I think resonates with us because we were raised to believe that we don't put ourselves under the authority of a person, that we are governed by values and we're governed by an idea. And that's something that um, you don't see in, you, you don't see it in, until you again, go back to the Bible and to some extent to this moment where the people say, nah, it's okay. We'll, we'll throw ourselves under, under the leadership of a King. We'll give up freedom will give up freedom and values for leadership and uh, being able to go to war. So it's, it's, this is, you know, arguably again, one of the most tragic, tragic moments in Jewish history uh, at a crossroads that we chose this, this other path. I mean, who knows the alternative, you know, who knows how Jewish history, how world history would have been different, but this is not what this was not necessarily you could say what god wanted because here's what happens and the lord said to samuel heed their demands and appoint a king for them samuel then said to the men of israel all of you go home and so that is the end of chapter eight um again um some would argue that Samuel chapter eight is the crux of maybe everything that happens after in Jewish, in at least biblical history, the moment where the people say, we're going to, we're going to go with the king. So this is, uh, it's why we read this. This is why, uh, uh, you know, as I said, it's one of the foundational texts kind of understood in, in, in uh in america as well so let's read what happens now in the second half of class today we're going to read about who that lucky young man is who's going to be king there was a man of benjamin whose name was kish son of aviel son of zoror son of bekorat son of aphia a benjaminite a man of substance he had a son whose name was saul an excellent young man no one among the Israelites was handsomer than he. He was a head taller than any of the people. <laughs> we read about well, his qualifications. He was good looking and tall. <laughs> yes. Not a bad way to win an election either. <laughs> it's uh, well, you, you know, the you know, the uh, the average height of our presidents has been substantially higher than mm -hmm. uh the average height of an American male. Um, I will tell you what it is right now because I remembered it at one point, but especially uh, in the last uh, age of, of- That's been historically true for us in terms of bishops. <laughs> really? Yes, until recent times. Wow. Um, 
I so, have to say, when I lost an election, my opponent was taller. <laughs> well, Rosemary, that's not fair. <laughs> it's so, true. Know, but, <laughs> there may have other reasons, but <laughs> no, the the uh, yeah the the um, I mean, even people that we didn't think. I mean, there were some short presidents, but they were all pre. They were all pre television. The shortest president in the television age is Jimmy Carter. He was five, he was only 5'10". Nixon was six feet. Gerald Ford was six feet. Those guys were six feet. Barack Obama was 6'2". George H.W. Bush, 6'2". Thomas, uh, oh, Bill Clinton and Thomas Jefferson were both 6'2". Uh, Donald Trump, 6'3". Lyndon Johnson, 6'4". And of course, as we know, Abraham Lincoln was giant, but he was 6'4". So he was the same size as Lyndon Johnson. So we don't often think about Lyndon Johnson being the same height as, as Abraham Lincoln. I think he was a little broader. But uh, yeah, our presidents in the tele, in the age of television have been substantially taller than, uh, you know, not substantially, but, you know, a good few inches taller than, than, uh, than the average American man. So um, yeah, James Madison came in at the shortest at 5'4", and Martin Van Buren was, and Benjamin Harrison were only 5'6". So, um, look, you know, this was, this was... Uh, how about George? George, yeah, I was going to look and see how tall George Washington was. I, I thought he was tall, but maybe, I think maybe he was, I think he might have come in at 6'2". Um, but he was substantially taller than, than most... Uh, was he taller than George the <laughs> Third? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> George Washington was 16. Yeah. Uh, George the third was, uh, let's see how tall he was. He was, uh, hmm. he was, oh, this doesn't help me. He, it's gives, giving me his, uh, no, that's not even George the third. Uh, he was, I don't know doesn't say what his height was here um but uh i'm sure there's somewhere here Ooh, queen elizabeth is only five four but i don't think queens have to be i don't think i don't think they have to be tall anyway somebody can give me his uh somebody can give me his height and weight somebody can look that up um oh he was five five ten there you go. <laughs> so, it's not terribly short, but it's would not have looked. He would not have looked impressive and with. But I don't but know. That, taller than average at that point. Yes, I don't think he mm -hmm. would have looked necessarily short. But I think George Washington and a lot of people have commented this. You know, especially during the 18th century, was a fairly tall, fairly tall guy, and a lot of people actually compare him to King Saul in some ways because of his. You know, he was considered a handsome man. He had, uh, he was taller. And, you know, again, this, this text says, you know, he was a head taller than, than, than the people. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is an impressive physical specimen. It says he was an excellent young man. And again, it's difficult to, um, you know, know in what ways that he, you know, in what, what, what ways he was, he was excelling. Um, but we're, as we're going to read, uh, his height was maybe, um, and his good looks and his physical appearance uh, didn't match his confidence level. Once the asses of Saul's father, Kish, went astray, and Kish said to his son, Saul, take along one of the servants and go out and look for the asses. He passed into the hill country of Ephraim. He crossed the district of Shalisha, but they did not find them. They passed through the district of Shalim, but they were not there. They traversed the entire territory of Benjamin and still they did not find them. When they reached the district of Ziph, Saul said to the servant who was with him, let us turn back or my father will stop worrying about the asses and begin to worry about us. But he replied, there is a man of God in that town and the man is highly esteemed. Everything that he says comes true. Let us go there. Perhaps he will tell us about the errand on which we set out. 
But if we go, Saul said to his servant, what can we bring the man? For the food in our bags is all gone and there is nothing we can bring to the man of God as a present. What have we got? That's the phrase, by the way. Mahitanu. What do we, what do we got? What what do we got? Mahitanu. <laughs> I'll remember that. The servant answered to Saul again, I happen to have a quarter shekel of silver. I can give that to the man of God and he will tell us about our errand. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he would say, come, let us go to the seer. For the prophet of today was formerly called a seer. Saul said to his servant, a good idea, let us go. And they went to the town where the man of God lived. Yeah. Now, by the way, so some of this language, and again, you can see the note here. Uh, <clears throat> We haven't, he hasn't been called seer yet, but he will be. Uh, and they find it interesting that, again, that he's going to use that word. He calls him a seer. Um, uh, a, a, it's called a roe, one who literally is a seer. I mean, that's this, that's why it's translated as a one who sees, um, which is, again, the origin for the word, the, the, uh, the English word seer. So it perfectly, it works perfectly. Um, now it's weird because they don't seem to, well, I'll get to that second point in a, in a moment. Um, so clearly we, we see that, that, that Saul has a sense of, um, purpose. Like, you know, he wants to, you know, he wants to finish the job. Um, he also recognizes that at a certain point, you know, we, we're going to cause more problems by being out for a long time. Um, but what's interesting about Saul is that we, we learn right away that he has, he comes from money, right? He's not a poor kid. He's not poor. This is not a, this is not a rags to riches story. This is the story of a person who is fairly wealthy before they become a leader. Now, before we, you know, before we kind of, uh, reflect on, uh, you know, on this and say, well, that's not fair. You know, this is just about the rich getting richer. Um, I will remind you that most of the presidents of our country were not born in poverty. Very few of them have the Abraham Lincoln log cabin story, right? Most of the people who've been president, including during the time of President Lincoln, did not start at the bottom. Uh, some of the people who became president were from the wealthiest families in uh, and it was maybe even more so a hundred years ago because the Roosevelt's were some of the wealthiest people in New York. I mean, these were really, really wealthy people. The, um, you know, we talk about the Bushes. Uh, Kennedy's too. Bush's wealth and the Kennedy's wealth, while it was newer wealth, it wasn't Roosevelt generational wealth. Yeah. It was new money and perhaps <laughs> some of it ill-gotten ill -gotten money in the case of the Kennedys. Uh, it was uh, definitely enormous wealth. So yes, it doesn't matter the party. It doesn't matter whether, again, we can look at the recent stories of, of Donald Trump, but it, this goes back oh. to the very beginning. And the reality was that George Washington was not a poor man either. So, and was mm -hmm. not poor before he was president, when he was born and after he was president. So the idea that these are, you know, self-made men, if if you will, in the sense that again they created their own, that's it, that's not the norm. That's not been the case in our country with elected leaders. Uh, and again, we expect the kings to uh, be born into wealth because they're kings. But we don't really stray that far from, you know, these other stories where, uh, you know it doesn't hurt to come from wealth. What's interesting about this situation for Sam, for, uh, for Saul meeting Samuel for the first time is that he doesn't have any money. And so here's the story of a kid who's got money, right? Who's, who's going to see the guy and he's like, well, we don't have anything. We can't go. We don't have any money. So this is an understanding of, of um, look, if the guy was poor to begin with, he might not be thinking about this. He's like, I don't have anything to begin with. But in this case, this is a kid who knows better, who has money. And he's literally saying, what do we got? We I, look in your pocket. I don't have anything. So these are wealthy kids 
that essentially got lost, right? They're, they're lost. They're doing a job for their dad. If you want to use the modern, if you want to imagine the modern, these are wealthy kids driving their dad's car, driving around, doing an errand for their dad. They can't find, you know, the, the, the guy to, they got to pick up some money. They can't find it. And they go, they want to find the person who can tell them where to go, but they don't have anything to pay that guy. So that's the problem. They, they, they are wealthy to begin with. And that, that kind of, again, makes the story somewhat humorous. Um, it's a character note for Saul that he doesn't have a lot of foresight. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, yes, but it's also, it's, yes, it's also that he gets himself into jams. Yes. Now, again, should he have- But, but he, a little planning would have, you know, he could have yeah. said, okay, we've got this much money, we can go this far, then we're going to have to turn back. to do that. So because, because it's the servant who has the money, right? The servant, he turns yeah. to the servant, and, you know, well, the, you servant, got anything, right? the servant's got the money, right? The servant has a couple bucks in his pocket where the wealthy kid, who's the one whose dad sent them out on the job, he doesn't have the money. So yes, he, he's gotten himself into a jam mm-hmm. and he is about to give up right so he's about to give up so it's interesting about that now there is this weird phrase here which is formally in israel so whenever you see that it's a pretty good indication that this was written later than it happened right so when when they're repeating language that of what people did say and they recognize that they're using an anachronism they recognize that it's an anachronism so they recognize that which is why they call attention to it they didn't have to do that. And it's one of the things that I want you to pay attention to as we go through the book of Samuel. When you see phrases like that, to me, to me, and to other people who've read the Bible before, who look at it and want to know what, what can we say is, is real, happened in real time that, you know, is just myth, isn't mythological, isn't invented. There's this sense when we read the book of Samuel that when we come to these kind of phrases, that they're actually indicative of the fact that people recognize that this stuff happened, that it's not just a matter of saying, you know, well, this is what they, because it actually gives us a context for why they said the wrong thing. And so there's actually a sense that, well, somebody, somebody took the time to remember or to, to say what they said and to, um, to report it. And that's why, you know, we call it reportage, but it really does feel like when we read in the book of Samuel that people who are writing this kept records of it, kept the stories going, uh, and were documenting things. They weren't just making stories like, well, let's have this story happen this way, where they kind of like wrote it and they composed it. No, they're actually like copying stuff down and they're, and they're recognizing that these uh, dialogues or these discussions happened and people actually paid attention to it. So they were there to they were there to be copied. They were there to be retold. So kind of keep that in mind uh, when we see this. It's just the tone of the language, the language feeling, which which is so real. Okay, so here we go. Saul said to his servant, "A good idea. Let us go." And they went to the town where the man of God lived. As they were climbing the ascent to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water, and they asked them. Is the seer in town? Yes, they replied. He's up there ahead of you. Hurry, for he has just come to the town because the people have a sacrifice at the shrine today. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the shrine to eat. The people will not eat until he comes, for he must first bless the sacrifice, and only then will the guests eat. Go up at once, for you will find him right away. And again, here is this description of what he does when he comes to town right he this is what he does um let me just make sure this note here see again hurry for he's just reached um again looking at the septuagint there's maybe a word missing here which makes more makes it a little clear doesn't change the meaning of it which is he's just come to town he, you, you caught him at the right time, which again seems to indicate that, you know, they happen to be at the right place at the right time. They could have missed him, but they didn't. They caught him. So here's what happens. 
So they went up to the town, and as they were entering the town, Samuel came out toward them on his way up to the shrine. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed the following to Samuel. At this time tomorrow, I will send a man to you from the territory of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him ruler of my people Israel. He will deliver my people from the hands of the Philistines, for I have taken note of my people. Their outcry has come to me. As soon as Samuel saw Saul, the Lord declared to him, this is the man that I told you would govern my people. Yep. So, uh, again, you look at the Septuagint has um, the plight of my people. Does it change the phrase? No. Um, it's, I guess, more powerful or more, um, you know, indicative of how bad the situation is. Um that God is saying, I got to do something about this. Uh, again, it doesn't seem like at the time that the Philistines were a big problem. The Philistines kind of got put back in their place during the time of Samuel, but it seems as though it's not enough. And Saul is, is the guy. He's going to be the guy. And uh, Samuel's warned. God tells him, we, we read about it in reverse, in the sense that now we read that Samuel was told that this guy was coming to him. Uh, he's from Benjamin, uh, you know, the tribe that we almost wiped out in the book of Judges is now going to give us our first king. Uh, it's the center tribe. It's the tribe around Jerusalem. It's the it's the it's a small tribe, but it's a powerful militarily. We know they're skilled warriors, the kind of people that you'd want to have leading an army. Unless there be any question who this guy is, God actually tells him the moment he sees him, this is the guy. This is the guy. So Samuel is without doubt when he sees him, when he sees Saul for the first time. Saul approached Samuel inside the gate and said to him, tell me, please, where is the house of the seer? And Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up ahead of me to the shrine, for you shall eat with me today. And in the morning, I will let you go after telling you whatever may be on your mind. Wow. So that's coincidental. He goes up to the guy and says, where's the seer? He goes, I'm the seer. I'm the guy you're looking for. Um, that's very fortuitous that he gets to see the guy uh, right away. Um, it also indicates that, um, and again, this was before we have photographs and video and mm -hmm. the ways that people would know who, who, who is who. Um, there's a weird thing that happens here, which is um, whatever, however Samuel is dressed, whatever type of people are around him, whatever distinction he has, he, Saul doesn't see it. Saul doesn't know it. Again, there aren't photographs and there aren't videos, so it's not like he knows who Samuel is. But shouldn't he have known who Samuel was? Wouldn't he have seen some indication that Samuel is, but there's a bigger issue. He doesn't even know Samuel's name. Samuel is a judge, the judge, the prophet for the people, and he calls, keeps calling him the seer. Like, doesn't he know who Samuel is? So something is either happening here where Samuel isn't as powerful as we think he is, or Saul is just really dumb. And it doesn't seem like he's alone being dumb because the servant doesn't know who he is. There doesn't seem to be a real indication that this is a guy who's in charge when he sees him. So it's very weird that Samuel, for all his importance that we'd think he'd have, doesn't seem to have that kind of recognition. So. It's a very strange 
there's a very strange like we're missing something here because he doesn't even know his name isn't he going to say samuel the judge samuel our leader samuel samuel the samuel he doesn't seem to even say him say his name so it's a very strange if you will step back from this point where the people have just you know kind of turned to samuel said we need a king they recognize samuel as the guy who called him into battle against the philistines it doesn't seem like he's really well known is is there any evidence anywhere else in other writings that it's like instead of you know calling you for instance mark or mark blazer we call you rabbi mark so that it's more like a, an honorific that he's using or is that not anywhere used I guess, but in it that way get, it's still it could be but it still doesn't get to the point of why doesn't he know who he is why doesn't he even know his name there doesn't seem to be a recognition of he, because he doesn't he when when his friend originally tells him hey there's a there's a seer there he doesn't tell him hey you know samuel the guy that talks to god i mean like you can't get any bigger than that you'd think so the issue is there there seems to be a a, a there there seems to be some kind of dissonance between what we've been reading about samuel for the last couple of chapters and what happens here this first meeting so again either the benjaminites are not really paying attention to what's going on or samuel's family doesn't pay attention to what's going on or samuel doesn't pay attention to what's going on but it is weird and or it's, it's written by or it's written by david's scribes that's the that's the that's what some people say some people say that the dissonance between the two versions of samuel indicate that there are two writers and that is what most biblical scholars will say i'm not i, I mean I'm not that concerned with it. And that's why I didn't point it out, but I was about to point it out. And you just pointed it out, which is that the, that the documentary hypothesis and the, and the idea that there's more than one author here writing is, is maybe this is maybe one of those places where it, it's easier to just say, this is just written by somebody different who doesn't, who doesn't have Samuel, uh, doesn't quite have the same role for Samuel as the other writer does, which is there's a, Samuel, there's a Samuel. Well, no, no, exactly what you said, which is there's a Samuel writer who's a monarchist, and then there's a Samuel writer who's more of a Republican who doesn't really want kings, right? And so for the Samuel who doesn't really want kings, he's got him lashing out at the people saying, What are you doing? You're stupid, you're gonna be a and then the other Samuel is like, Well, I got you know, I'm doing God's work and you know, I'm making a king. And that's what I do. I'm the, or it's I'm the, David, or it's David's people downplaying the role that Saul had to make himself look better. Well, saying that look, this guy didn't even know, you know, trying to paint him bumbling as it were. It, 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 yeah, it could be. Other than the fact that, yeah, I mean, other than the fact that it doesn't seem like anybody is fully. Well, I don't know. Um, the, the issue is, is that the David author is the monarchist. I mean, I'm not going to give it away, but the, the David author is the one who's going to say, this is why we got to have kings, because King David is the king. So, um, uh, um, let me just see if there's any other. Uh, wait, I'm just going to see. I went a little too far. Uh, um, You know, I don't know. Um, you can make the argument, that the, and it's not a good argument, that the people in the town don't say, yeah, Samuel's here. She, you know, they, they, she just says yes, but I, I don't know. Um, uh, so, um, you, you know, look, I'm only going to because we've already said it i'm just going to just finish up the thought the, the if it's possible that this writer doesn't know or doesn't care or doesn't have the 
read the, the previous chapter. If you just read this, at this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the territory of Benjamin and you shall anoint him my, my uh, ruler of my people, Israel. He would deliver my people from the hands of the Philistines for I have taken the note of my people's, the plight of my people. Their outcry has come to me. There's nothing in that phrase that indicates anything that God has any problem with a king. Nothing there is, yeah, I know we don't want the king, but we got to have the king, and this is why the king's coming. There's nothing there. It, to the contrary, it sounds a little bit like Moses uh, heard my, the cry of my people, and I'm delivering them from the Philistines, which is why they're having a king. It doesn't even matter whether they want a king doesn't say here the people have asked for a king even it's simply you're making a king so that's why again some people say this doesn't even seem to be the same author so that is those kind of things are the things where people say well why is it so different here all right so um meanwhile let's get back to samuel and saul uh so um um Here's what he says, sorry. And Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up ahead of me to the shrine for you shall eat with me today. And in the morning, I will let you go after telling you whatever may be on your mind. As for your asses that strayed three days ago, do not concern yourself about that for they have been found. And for whom is all Israel yearning if not for you and all your ancestral house? Saul replied, but I'm only a Benjaminite from the smallest of the tribes of Israel. And my clan is the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin. Why do you say such things to me? Yeah. And this sounds a lot like Moses, right? What am I? Why are you asking me? I, I, I have no, there's nothing special about me. My tribe's not special. We're a small tribe. And even within my tribe, our group is the smallest. So what? I don't have anything. So Samuel, uh, you know, again, tells him you, the stuff, the, the, the donkey, the asses, we found them. They're, they're, don't worry about those. They're okay. They're okay. But what we're really looking for, what everyone in Israel is looking for, is you. And that's a really powerful phrase, right? Because you know, as much as, again, Saul's, as you said, is hesitant to say the least, he's told that you are the answer to our prayers. And that is the way he's told that he's going to be king. So it's not, hey, you're going to be king. Uh, God wants you to be king. But the way he says it is that you are the answer to our prayers. So that is what he says and if Saul is not smart he knows right away what Samuel's telling him so he gets it he gets it let's see what the note here is it's again it's more of a scribal error than a than a something else in the Septuagint so so Saul says not me <laughs> I'm the wrong guy so here's what Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of the guests, who numbered about 30. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion which I gave you and told you to set aside. The cook lifted up the thigh and what was on it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, what has been reserved is set before you. Eat. It has been kept for you for this occasion when I said I was inviting the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. So let's take a look at this verse because you can notice a few, uh, a few notes here. One is maybe again this special piece of meat uh, is indicative of something special. Again, uh, there seems to be some words or either words are missing or context isn't understood which is that this meal is a symbolic meal in that what what samuel is telling saul is that your meal is 
essentially we're saying you're special. You are not going to um, be eating what everybody else eats. You're, you're, you've been, you've been set aside. And uh, he learns his role from the food set before him. They then descended from the shrine to the town and Samuel talked with Saul on the roof. Early at the break of day, Samuel called to Saul on the roof. He said, get up and I will send you off. Saul arose and the two of them, Samuel and he, went outside. And if you know, look here, uh, I think it's actually, well, didn't come out. Um, again, there's another section here that was maybe cut off in the, here, it starts here. Uh, Septuagint reads, they spread a bed for Saul on the roof and he lay down. So that's a whole phrase that's maybe missing out of the Masoretic text, the text that we have. Uh, because there does seem to be something missing from they went on to the roof and then he called to him from the roof. Um, what is the symbolic nature of this time up on the roof? Well, maybe he's telling them, you know, with this view out in front of, you know, in front of them, that, you know, you got to have, you got to be able to look to the future. You got to be able to look out over, uh, over a wider expanse and understand that there's a bigger job for you coming up. But this time that he spends with, with Samuel, that Saul spends with Samuel, ends up, again, telling, you know, he's told by the guy in charge, that you're going to be the new guy in charge, that you're going to be king. A new job. No one's ever been king. As they were walking toward the end of the town, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to walk ahead of us. And he walked again. But you stop here a moment, and I will make known to you the word of God. Samuel took a flask of oil and poured some on Saul's head and kissed him and said, the Lord herewith anoints you ruler over his own people yep and uh well that's not really a big help and here we though have anoint you ruler over his people israel and you will govern the people of the lord and deliver them from the hands of their foes round about and this is the sign for you that the lord anoints you ruler over his own people so you, you could say whoa that's a couple of lines of the bible that just disappeared how did that happen and the reason that it might have happened is because it's one line of text and what happened here was the lord anoints you right ruler over his people and you will govern and this is a sign that he anoints you the word anoints you ruler and anoints you ruler if it was on the same lines originally a scribe could have missed the line and just started started the line from where it says ki mashicha adonai that god has anointed you uh and so that line disappeared because the line repeated the the phrase repeated and the person missed that other part of the text so it's very possible that that was a scribal error that was based on the words anoint you as ruler, which in Hebrew is Moshiach. You are the anointed ruler. That's what the word Moshiach, Messiah means. It means anointed. It doesn't mean king. It doesn't mean uh, salvation. It doesn't mean all the other words that are kind of attributed to it, especially in Christianity. But originally, it simply means the one that has been anointed with oil. And the first, you know, king that's anointed with oil is this guy, King Saul. So he is anointed. He has made the Messiah, the anointed one. That's what it originally means. Doesn't even necessarily mean king. It means anointed one. The anointed one, the one that oil has been put on. 
So Samuel says, I'm going to tell you the word of God. But at least here, it's either missing or, you know, I've discussed the big plan with you, but now I'm actually, now this phrase, God has anointed you, Adonai has anointed you to lead his people. That phrase might have been the phrase that not only Saul is anointed with, but every other king afterwards is anointed with. The Lord anoints you, the ruler over his people. And that's the word, al nachalato lenagid, you know, to rule, to lead, to, uh, you know, to, to, um, you know, to, to rule over as, as the leader, to, and that phrase, again, makes the, that's the first, he's the king at that moment. So he's made king by by Samuel at that moment. Now, in God's eyes, he's king. What we're going to finish up with now is what needs to happen in order for him to be king in front of everybody else. Because God has made his wishes known to, Sam, to Samuel knows. He's made it happen. But that isn't what has to happen in order for a person to be king. Because if it was, if it was just that, then, as we're going to see, being a king would simply to be have some oil put on your head. But it's not. There has to be some type of public ceremony. But it, literally at this moment, he's been made the Messiah. He's been made the anointed one. So what happens now? And this is what we'll read today. When you leave me today, you will meet two men near the tomb of Rachel in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will tell you that the asses you set out to look for have been found and that your father has stopped being concerned about the asses and is worrying about you saying, what shall I do about my son? So he was right. His dad does care about him. I just love the fact that if you ever wanted to know where Zelza comes from, for everyone who grew up in, in the valley, that's where it comes from. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, when we say the territory of Benjamin at Zelza, we would normally say Devonshire and Zelza or Shotsworth and Zelza or Ventura and Zelza. Zelza was a place in the territory of Benjamin. Uh, and uh, that is where, um, that is, according to this, this is where the, ter the tomb of Rachel is too which is interesting because it's indicative of the fact that Rachel's tomb was well known by the time, you know, in the time of, of King Saul, that it was, it was a well-known place. Um, well known enough that that's where people would, you know, know if you tell somebody to meet me at the tomb of Rachel, uh, where they were, you know, where they were going. Um, now, he knows where to go. He's just told him where to go and where to complete his mission, his mission in the first place. Cause he did have a job to do. He had to go back. He had to go get those asses and bring them back to his dad. So, so Saul is um, still, you know, doing, he's got to finish the, the family work before he gets to, to the big job of being King, uh, which again, you'd think that's, do you really have to find the rest of the donkeys when you just been named the king? But nope, that's what he's got to do. He's got to finish his job. Um, got to check in with his father. It's all about family. That's all. Yeah. yeah, but it's not like he goes back to his family. And he, it's not like he goes back to his dad and says, dad, forget the donkeys, all that stuff. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm king. Really? That's not what he does. He actually finishes his work in order and, and goes back to his dad. Um, which is interesting because again, it seems like seems like it really happened. Uh, it seems like all this stuff happened on his journey to finish his dad's work, um, and the details are even to where they meet. Again, for the people of Benjamin who are descendants of Rachel, who were born, Benjamin was born when Rachel died. Right as she's giving birth, she gives birth to Benjamin. 
think about what happens here. This is part of the narrative of the first king of Israel, who is a descendant of Rachel. And this is all going to go down in front of her, well, not all going to go down, but the next part of this goes down in front of her tomb. Her descendant is the first king. And remember, one of the last leaders of the Jewish people is also from the tribe of Benjamin, the one that we know is Esther and her cousin slash uncle, maybe Mordechai. They are also from the tribe of Benjamin. So these are the Benjaminites. And again, we just don't know whether he's uncle or cousin, but again, the Benjaminites make their appearance there too. So here we go. You shall pass on from there until you come to the Terebinth of Tabor. There you will be met by three men making a pilgrimage to God at Bethel. One will be carrying three kids. Another will be carrying three loaves of bread. And the third will be carrying a jar of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept. After that, you are to go on to the hill of God where the Philistine prefects reside. There, as you enter the town, you will encounter a band of prophets coming down from the shrine, preceded by lyres, timbrels, flutes, and harps, and they will be speaking in ecstasy. By the way, so this is a couple notes that are not necessarily again hugely important but they're um again these weird details of what saul's going to see on his way back so the you know again this is what you're going to see and these are really really detailed you know but don't you love a band of prophets <laughs> exactly right and so these are prophets that are doing what prophets do they're speaking in ecstasy they are again talking and we we had a as you see the note was from numbers this is when eldad and medad were speaking in ecstasy in front of moses and mo i mean moses you know he doesn't he doesn't care but joshua says to him hey you're gonna let these people speak in ecstasy while you're there so um you know, this is really, you know, quite detailed stuff. So here it continues. The spirit of the Lord will grip you and you will speak in ecstasy along with them. You will become another man. And once these signs have happened to you, act when the occasion arises, for God is with you. And here again, it's it's uh, the, the phrase that's used there. And again, when you see these, these um, uh, words and quotes, I mean, uh, brackets and parentheses that um, those are scribal and it's not a big difference. It's literally the difference between a, a Yud and a, and a, um, a one without a Yud, a, a phrase without a Yud. These are, these are proof for Saul that he is, this is, this is God's will, right? This is what, me, this is what you're going to see. So you're going to see these things. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time so that you know when I'm telling you that God's chosen you, that you know that this is true. But it's going to get even wilder because you're actually going to go into ecstasy too. So you're actually going to, like it says, become another man. You're going to, um, something's going to happen to you. And then, then when this stuff happens, that's how you're going to know that God is with you. So, you know, you could say, well, gosh, he's giving me all these details. I really do believe it. No, Samuel actually tells him, you'll know, and, and you'll know God is with you. So don't, you know, this is the, I am telling you why this is happening. This is so that, you know, God is with you. So it seems to me that these things should have happened after, I mean, before he, anointing him the anointing should have happened after he became another man not correct. before yeah correct so so having him having him take on the ritual of anointing is is number one interesting because it's not done in public um but that's an interesting thing about the way saul the samuel does what he does later on with king david as well there is this understanding that that literally that the moment that the guy actually becomes king is a moment 
for the prophet and, and the king. It's not that it's not a public moment, that there's a there's actually before the king takes on this role publicly, he has a private moment and even to some extent in Saul's case, feels God working in on him, you know, is possessed by the Holy Spirit, if you will, which is what kind of says is going to happen. Um that 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 is going to be the proof that that he is the right person to some extent what it really is saying is is that god has chosen you where you're at right now you'll grow into it you're going to become this guy and you don't feel it yet but you are this person and and it's strange because again we don't know saul's qualifications other than he's tall and he's handsome and he you know he's 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 physically you know, ready for this, but we really don't, we, we really don't see that he's emotionally or mentally ready for this. But again, maybe that's why it's done in reverse. Keep this in mind, by the way, too, because of we, we, we're real close to the end, but we're, we're also close to this public, when the public first gets to see Saul, which is, again, it meant to be humorous is it meant to be belittling is it meant by somebody who was part of king david's group meant to make saul look foolish i don't know those are all possibilities or is it just recounting you know, what's going on for a guy who who's just you know not mature does rabbinical ordination include anointing no no but it does include the putting of laying on of hands which is what happens with Joshua, which is what Moses does to Joshua. So the rabbinical ordination, what we call smicha, literally is putting on hands. So it's not it's not anointing. Whose hands? You know, the the rabbis who are passing on to you rabbinical authority. So, so they actually have to touch you, uh, you know, on the shoulders. I mean, they, I don't want to make it seem weird. There was there was a ceremony literally where the rabbi, you, you know, the 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 Beit Din, the group of rabbis who actually give you ordination. Ordination literally smicha means putting on hands, laying on of hands. So the the transmission of rabbinical authority to some extent goes from Moses to Joshua to then Joshua to the prophets to the to the judges to the and that goes to um, that goes to the, the rabbis believe is passed on to them. And then they pass it from one rabbi to the other. So we're we're passing mosaic authority, not 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 kingship, not the, not not the uh, monarchy. The monarchy is passed on by oil, and um, uh, I'm trying to think of other people that have oil. There are other people who have oil placed on them in in the Hebrew Bible, but it's more of um, it's more of of this type of situation of god choosing somebody um rather than again leading leading by teaching which is which is the, the hands being placed on them but uh yeah i mean oil becomes anointing becomes important in christianity but it, it's not it's it's really reserved for for uh it's really reserved for, for the, for the king. All right. Uh, so again, Samuel tells him, this is how you'll know. And here's after that, you are to go down to Gilgal ahead of me, and I will come down to you to present burnt offerings and offer sacrifices of well-being. Wait seven days until I come to you and instruct you what you are to do next. As Saul turned around to leave, God gave him another heart, and all those signs were fulfilled that same day. And when they came there to the hill, he saw a band of prophets coming toward him. Thereupon the Spirit of God gripped him, and he spoke in ecstasy among them. When all who knew him previously saw him speaking in ecstasy together with the prophets, the people said to one another, what's happened to the son of Kish? To Saul too among the prophets. But another person there spoke up and said, and who are their fathers? Thus the proverb arose, is Saul too among the prophets? So this is a phrase that became part of 
became an idiom, right? Saw to among the prophets became a phrase, a proverb, a, a way of, a way of, uh, you know, saying something that everybody would know from, from, you know, from the idiom, what, what they're talking about. Uh, so, um, Saul, by taking on a prophetic style and, and this, you know, speaking in ecstasy is showing that he's not a normal kind of person, run-of-the-mill person anymore. Um, and it's not something that these people expect. Let's just see the note here. Uh, is it a slighting? Yes, maybe. Because, you know, in calling him Bain Quiche, not, you know, a not, a not Saul. So there's not nothing missing there. They're just wondering if perhaps that phrase is meant to be, you know, dismissive of, of Saul at this point. So he, again, everything, let's just look at this note here. Same thing here, which Gibeah instead of the hill. Um, and so here's what, uh, here's what Saul does. And when he stopped speaking in ecstasy, he entered the shrine. Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, where did you go to look for the asses? He replied. And when we saw that they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. So here now, as he's recounting the story, he doesn't call him a seer. He says, we went to Samuel. And it's Saul's uncle actually, who, and says his uncle first comes to him and says, where were you? Tell me, said Saul's uncle, what did Samuel say to you? Saul answered his uncle. He just told us that the asses had been found, but he did not tell him anything of what Samuel had said about the kingship. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. He left that part out. He left that part out. He didn't say anything to his uncle about what was the real, with well, a real big story here is uh, I'm king now, dad, hey, uncle. I, I, I got to tell you something, uncle. Um, I well, don't worry about the donkeys anymore. I'm the one in charge of everything. So here's what it says. Samuel summoned the people to the Lord at Mitzpah and said to them, thus said the Lord, the God of Israel. I brought you brought Israel out of Egypt and I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and of all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But today you have rejected your God who delivered you from all your troubles and calamities for you said no set up a king over us now station yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. Samuel brought forward each of the tribes of Israel and the lot indicated the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah, so um, uh, is it possible that we just went back to the other Samuel? Yes, given the fact that we just had this line again, which is uh, you've asked us to put a king over us even after everything God did for you. And now it seems as though Samuel is going to, show people how they have a new king where they get a uh, draw lots. And here's the lot situation. Then Samuel brought forward the tribes of Benjamin by its clans and the clan of the Matrites was indicated and then Saul son of Kish was indicated. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. They inquired of the Lord again, has anyone else come here? And the Lord replied, yes. He is hiding among the baggage. Yeah. And so again, the Septuagint says uh, that there was a line missing, which is they bring up, and it looks like probably it was originally there. They bring up the, the Benjaminites and then they bring up this clan and they bring up, you know, they, they whittle down, you know, they keep drawing out lots. So it seems as like there was another line here with the lots, but anyways, it doesn't matter. I mean, the bottom line is they get to, the lots and they call out Saul. But where's Saul? He's hiding among the baggage. Again, not a 
huge difference in the Septuagint, but uh, so again, the Septuagint and the or the Dead Sea Scrolls actually, I think this is no it's Septuagint, yeah, uh, has the build up for the lotter for the lottery. Um, I guess the Shirley Jackson lottery more than the the Mega Millions lottery. So they're they're find the guy right and bring out the guy, um, but he's hiding, so it does not seem that Saul is ready. So they ran over and brought him from there, and he took his place among the people. He stood ahead taller than all the people. And Samuel said to the people, do you see the one whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people acclaimed him, shouting, long live the king. Yep, and that's what it, it's exactly what you'd expect. Long live the king. Yechi HaMelech. Yechi HaMelech. That's what they claim. Long live the king. Or live the king, but long live the king is fine. Uh so it literally just says live the king, but let the king live. Um, here, it does not seem that the two have met before, at least in this version. In this version, Saul looks like a doofus. Both stories have been combined together. It doesn't really matter. We're, we're left with the idea that Saul does know who, who he's going to be called and that's why he's hiding. Uh, it, do, it doesn't matter. The, the bottom line is, is that Saul is a reluctant, well, maybe it does matter, but the, the combined story here is Saul is a reluctant guy to uh, be called. So again, the way the stories are, are, have been woven together, it doesn't matter. The, he's there. He knows, what his, he knows what's going to happen and he doesn't want to come. Um, And Samuel expounded to the people the rules of the monarchy and recorded them in a document which he deposited before the Lord. Samuel then sent the people back to their homes. Saul also went home to Gibeah, accompanied by upstanding men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, how can this fellow save us? So they scorned him and brought him no gift that he pretended not to mind. Yeah, and if you look at the note here, uh, what we're left with, and again, let's just see if this note here gives us anything. Uh, this is in the Septuagint and the Qumran. Uh, not a huge... Uh, um, yeah it doesn't really it doesn't really change the meaning of it the Qumran uh, and Septuagint there of uh, versions but basically again Saul is accompanied back to his home by good guys as opposed to some guys who are scoundrels who new guy that's their king um, interestingly the people who are not impressed with the king are called scoundrels now it doesn't seem like they had a problem with their being a king they just don't want this guy to be king and again maybe that's why they didn't bring him a gift um as it says right here he pretends not to mind uh that means he did mind the fact that these people are not recognizing me, recognizing him as king. So is it an easy transition? Well, it's not, it's not that bad, but there's definitely people who are not going along with this or they're not going along with him. So a Benjaminite being chosen king, not necessarily the first uh, would be the first choice. Was there another version of the story of how Saul got, told he was king um where he tells his family or whatever it doesn't really matter this is the version of the story that we have combined uh and samuel makes sure everyone knows he's king because he did it he did it at mitzpah the same place where he convened everybody to do the battle against the philistines they come back to mitzpah for this convocation and it's done in front of the people it doesn't say you know some of the people it says the people all the people i mean 
doesn't say all the people, but it says the nation. It's the the people. It's not a. Tr- it's not one tribe. And um, you know, you could make the argument. Uh, you could make the argument that Samuel's uh, anointing, or not anointing, but his uh, proclamation, acclamation of King Saul, uh, is not fully heartfelt um because he says and there's none like him among all the people um doesn't necessarily mean he's the best of all the people um but um the people are people take it as a good sign and it says i mean it says and all the people acclaimed him and it actually says um, that all the people acclaimed him saying long live the king so um you know, look, um, and by the way, here it also says all the people. It says Kol Ha'am. It doesn't just say the Am. Anyways, it's all the people who are there. They they see him. They acclaim him. Uh, does Saul go on and on about him? No. No. Uh, as a matter of fact, you could read this as somewhat disparaging. Do you see the one that – it all depends on how you punctuate it. It all depends on actually how you deliver it, Right. Do you see who the God, do you see who God's chosen? You know, there's none like him among all the people. And they go, long live the king. I mean, again, how heartfelt was Samuel when he did this proclamation? The point is, is that this is now the guy that is left with this tremendous job of of being the first king of Israel. King Saul is the first king. He is the he he to some extent is responsible not just to be the king of israel but to be the first king of israel he has the responsibility of kind of setting the stage and setting the tone for what happens after and it's really obviously going to be very important for king david because on one hand king david is not from the same dynasty right king king david essentially has to lead a coup but on top of it on top of it we have a problem in that David has a uh, it's a it's a tough situation for him because if he if he proves that God didn't make him king in the first place, Saul the king in the first place, then how is he king? So if there's not divine authority and divine call, then what's his kingdom based on? So it's a very precarious situation for King David. Uh, and keep in mind that whoever wrote this, whether they were pro King David or anti King David. Uh, the reality is, is that this is, this sets the tone for everything that happens after every other King of Israel that comes after. And so um, this is our introduction to King Saul. And so next week we're going to start reading about what King Saul does. And there is not a lot. I will tell you, we don't get a lot of information in the Bible about King Saul. It was either not included. Nobody wrote it. Nobody kept it uh it was destroyed all those possibilities most likely nobody kept it or nobody uh transmitted it to us most likely there was a log of what he did we don't have it so unfortunately um unfortunately we don't we don't we only have what we have so i wish we had more about king saul we don't we just met him uh and we're not going to get many more chapters about king saul um, alone we're almost going to be in king david right away all right everybody uh thank you rosemary again for uh for taking us everybody stay safe and healthy yes any announcements before we go away no all right well listen thank you rabbi mark everybody thank you and everybody stay healthy and we want to see you next week as we read about king saul and uh this very interesting guy who we don't know enough about take care everybody <laughs> All done.